Welcome to Mariner's Church. If we haven't met, my name is Eric. I'm the senior pastor here, and you have never seen me in a suit before, and why am I wearing a suit as I teach the scripture today? Because the passage of scripture we're gonna be in is the most important message that Daniel ever gave the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. It was the most important message. In fact, as he gave the message to Nebuchadnezzar, he likely is thinking, this is one of the main reasons that God brought me here to Babylon. But this message is for you too. This message is for me. It's super important, so I wanted to wear a suit to help get this message into our hearts and minds. It's a message about what is ultimately king in your life. Retailers have said, if you work in retail, traffic is king. Bill Gates, famous email that he sent all Microsoft employees was content is king. Business leaders have sometimes said cash is king. And all of these statements are essentially saying, listen, this thing right here is the most important thing in this season of our company or of our lives. Something is king. In the South, often college football is king. And recently, Netflix released a documentary called Swamp Kings, referring to the University of Florida football team that won multiple national championships. I grew up in New Orleans, and so we, you know, another SEC school, we did not like uh, the University of Florida. And so we, you know, I heard all kinds of jokes about University of Florida and other SEC teams that we would go against, such as this one. Um, There's this University of Florida football player, and he's bragging to some people at a party that he finished a puzzle in three months. And somebody says, it took you three months to complete a puzzle? And he says, yeah, but the box says it takes four to six years. Boom, that's how smart I am. So I wasn't a big University of Florida fan, but this Netflix documentary, The Swamp Kings, tell the story of this incredible University of Florida team, but it features also Urban Meyer, who is this famous, very successful, renowned coach. And football was king for him and for that team. But it wasn't really able to deliver true satisfaction to Urban Meyer. In fact, there's this one scene in the documentary where he describes after winning a national championship in 2008, not even celebrating in the locker room with his team, but being in a room next to the locker room texting recruits. I mean, listen, we've all heard stories, and and we've even lived this, where we have reached a goal, and we wake up a week later, and we have to set a new one. Or we have some kind of great thing happen in our life, and it doesn't quench us a month later or two months later. But I mean, get the scene. This coach, University of Florida coach, He is unable to even celebrate the night on the field or in the locker room with his team because he has to be sure he has this recruit for next year. This football being king, the Swamp King left him restless and unsatisfied. He says he had to drink and take to Ambien just to be able to go to sleep at night. So what happens in your life and my life when we make something the king, when we insert and something in our life is what rules and reigns over us, what is the end result? What really happens? In Daniel chapter four, we're walking through this incredible book of Daniel. You see Daniel interpret another dream for the king of Babylon. This man's name is Nebuchadnezzar. And he has a dream about a large tree that he doesn't understand. So he brings Daniel to to his palace again to interpret the dream. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, though he is ruling the largest kingdom in the world at the time, he, like Urban Meyer, is restless and unsatisfied. And some of you are restless and unsatisfied. He's gotten everything he wants, but it isn't enough. And so Daniel shows up and Nebuchadnezzar tells him the dream and then Daniel's gonna interpret the dream. Let's pick up the scripture in Daniel chapter four, verse 18. 
This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now Belshazzar, that's what he had called Daniel. Now Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation because none of the wise men of my kingdom can make the interpretation known to me, but you can because you have a spirit of the holy gods. Then Daniel, whose name is Belshazzar, was stunned for a moment and his thoughts alarmed him. The king said, Belshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar answered. So Daniel answered, my Lord, may the dream apply to those who hate you and its interpretation to your enemies. Let's stop here for a moment. Do you see that Daniel actually loves Nebuchadnezzar? He says, this dream, I'm gonna tell you the interpretation. It's such a painful dream that I wish it wasn't true for you. I wish it was true for your enemies. I mean, here's Daniel who was dragged away into Babylonian captivity as a young man. He has lived this conviction and this courage, this faith in God in front of Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar knows something's different in Daniel. He says, you're different from everybody else. You've got the spirit of the gods in you. But not only has Daniel had this conviction in front of Nebuchadnezzar, he's had compassion for Nebuchadnezzar. He's gonna tell him the interpretation of the dream, but he's saying, I wish this wasn't true for you because I I actually love you, I actually care for you. Do you care for the people that live around you? the people that are different from you. This is Daniel showing his conviction and compassion. Okay, here's the interpretation of the dream. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, whose top reached to the sky and was visible to the whole earth and whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and on it was food for all. Under it, wild animals lived and in it, its branches, the birds of the sky lived. That tree is you, Nebuchadnezzar. Your majesty, for you have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown and even reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the ends of the earth. The king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump (coughs) with its roots in the ground and with a band of iron and bronze around it in the tender grass of the field. Let him be drenched with dew from the sky and share food with the wild animals for seven periods of time. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree of the most high that has been issued against my Lord, the king. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle and be drenched with dew from the sky for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to anyone he wants. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you as soon as you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right and from your injustices by showing mercy to the needy. Perhaps this will be an extension of your prosperity. Okay, let's stop here for a moment. Notice Daniel is really emphasizing that Nebuchadnezzar, you're not the ultimate king, that there is a king above you and he's the one who gives kingdoms to anyone he wants. That there is another king, the king of kings who rules and reigns over everything and everything you have, Nebuchadnezzar, is ultimately from him and you have not acknowledged that it is from him. And everything that you have, everything I have, is from him as well. Everything we have is from this king. See, God actually created you to rule, to subdue. This is the very first chapter in the Bible. He does want you to be a king, but he wants you to be a king under him as the king. He wants you to rule, but he wants you to rule under him as the ultimate ruler first chapter in the Bible. Some scholars call this the cultural mandate. Some read this as it's only about having kids, being fruitful and multiplying. It's not only about having kids. It is about creating culture. It is about stewarding all that God has given us. Here it is, Genesis 1 verse 27. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply 
Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. So this is Genesis chapter one, first chapter in the Bible. This is before sin entered the world and messed everything up. You, me, humanity, created by God to rule, to be a king under him as our ultimate king. The Bible opens with us ruling under the rule of God. And the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, it ends when everything is made right with us ruling again under the rule of God. This is the last book in the Bible, Revelation 5 verse 10. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. So the Bible opens with us ruling under the rule of God. It ends with us gathered with him one day and we are reigning with him under the rule of God. The Bible opens this way, closes this way, but we live in the middle. And in the middle, all of us have been like Nebuchadnezzar. All of us have attempted to rule apart from the rule of God. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, there's a tree in the center. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree. You have made yourself the center of your life. And all of us have. We are all sinners. We've gone away from God's design. We're sinners because we've made ourselves the center of our dreams. We've made ourselves the center of our lives. There's another tree in the Bible that was in the center. And this is the third chapter of the Bible. This is when sin entered the world. There was a tree in the beautiful garden of Eden that the first humans were in, Adam and Eve. And God said, don't eat from this tree. But Adam and Eve decided we want to be the ones who rule. We don't want to be under the rule of God. We want to have authority over our own lives. We want to be our own kings apart from the king ruling over us. And they ate from the tree, disobeying God. Sin entered the world. We have been just like Nebuchadnezzar and just like Adam and Eve. We have all attempted to rule and reign over our own lives. There's two ways for you to live, two ways for me to live. One is to be a king, a ruler over whatever God gives you, to have dominion over whatever God gives you, but to be a ruler under the rule of God. The second way to live is to try to be a ruler apart from the rule of God. Think about it. When it comes to your work, your job, there's really two ways to approach your work. God wants to be the king over your work, for your work not to be the king of your life, but for you to view your work as something God has given you, and you're gonna steward it well to serve people. Or you make work the ultimate king, but when work becomes the king over you, it is never gonna quench you. No matter what happens, it won't be enough to satisfy you. Students, think about school. God wants you to be fruitful and multiply when it comes to school. Fruitful and multiply when it comes to work and fruitful and multiply when it comes to school. And one way to live is for you to realize that your classes and your sports and your relationships are all a gift from God and you take them to honor him. You're fruitful and you multiply and you make an impact and God works through you to serve other people or you attempt to put God aside and you make school or your hobbies or your sports the king. And those are great gifts, but they are really bad kings because they will not be able to satisfy you. Or our goals, and this is where I have been like Nebuchadnezzar so many times, because I've taken goals or dreams that God has given me, and if I am not careful, I can make them my obsession, the thing that I run after, that I give myself to, instead of viewing them as a gift that God has given me, and I, pursue them under his rule, I can easily take things he's given me and make them my ultimate thing, but they are cruel. When we make something else other than the king, Jesus, our ultimate king, 
It's a cruel king. It won't quench us. It won't satisfy us. And this is what's happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And so God is pursuing Nebuchadnezzar. He gives him this dream because he's going to bring Nebuchadnezzar low and show him that all the things you have built for yourself, they are not enough to quench you. And so the dream that God gave Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interpreted, it actually happens. Let's keep reading verse 28. We'll see what takes place. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king exclaimed, is this not Babylon the great I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory? So clearly, even after hearing the dream interpreted from Daniel, he's not getting it. We are often slow to get and receive God's pursuit of us. Verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away from your people to live with the wild animals and you will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to anyone he wants. At that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. I mean, he was brought low and humiliated. See, we sometimes mistake God's patience with apathy. God was really patient with Nebuchadnezzar and he's really patient with us. But we must not mistake his patience with us with apathy, that he doesn't care for us or care that we've removed him from being the king of our lives. Because God loves Nebuchadnezzar and because God loves you, he knows that if something else is the king of your life, you'll be like Nebuchadnezzar. You will be unsettled and unsatisfied. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. You've heard of the ancient wonder of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had the hanging gardens to look at, but that wonder wasn't enough to quench him. Urban Meyer had a championship and 20 minutes later, it wasn't enough to quench him. You make something else king and it won't be enough to quench you either. And so, he is brought really low. In fact, we read this, it's like he's a beast in, in, in the field. He's eating grass like cattle. I mean, he's at the lowest possible point. Sometimes God brings us to a low point and sometimes God lets our own choices bring us to a low point. Now, most of us aren't gonna become a crazy person like Nebuchadnezzar here and, and eat grass but really our own choices, we become a lot like a beast. We, we don't become who God intended us to be. We become so far away from his desire for us that we are stupid and senseless and we chase things that never will satisfy. But this is not the end of the story. I mean, this is amazing what happens next. And Daniel, would have to realize that he was brought into Babylonian captivity as a 15 year old to give this message years later to Nebuchadnezzar that would then be remembered by Nebuchadnezzar. You were about to see the turning point of the king of Babylon about to happen. You are gonna see a change that takes place in him because he realized at the lowest point that he could look up and there was a God who would restore him and a God who would rescue him. The God he heard about from Daniel, verse 34. But at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. He was so low that the only place to look was up and some of you have felt so low that the only place to look is up and it's a really good place to be. But at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned to me. 
Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. And here's his, his song of praise. The, this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, his heart is changed so much. He, he, he praised this. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing and he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my sanity returned to me and my majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out. I was reestablished over my kingdom and even more greatness came to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the king of the heavens because all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. This is the last words of Nebuchadnezzar that we have in the scripture and the last that you will see of him in the book of Daniel. And he was at a low point, but this became a turning point for Nebuchadnezzar. You see in this passage that though he was living like a beast, that God's desire was not to destroy Nebuchadnezzar because of his pride, but God was to desire was to deliver Nebuchadnezzar from his pride. And God's desire is not to destroy you, but God's desire is to deliver you. We see that God's heart for Nebuchadnezzar, this this pagan king, his heart was not to bring ruin to Nebuchadnezzar, but to restore restore Nebuchadnezzar. And God does, God restores the, the, the beauty and the glory of his kingdom. By God's grace, the low point, becomes the turning point. This was the lowest point of the king's life. But because God was gracious and pursued Nebuchadnezzar, this low point became the turning point. And he gave honor and glory to God and became a believer in him, trusted in him. And God was good to Nebuchadnezzar. By God's grace, the low point for you can become the turning point. Now, some of you are in a low point right now. Sometimes God orchestrates low points in our lives, just like he did with Nebuchadnezzar. But he did with Nebuchadnezzar because he wanted better for Nebuchadnezzar. Sometimes God orchestrates low points. Sometimes God allows low points to happen just from our own choices. And some of you right now are in an intense low point in your life. And you would say, gosh, the intensity of this low point is so severe. But understand that the intensity of your low point just reflects the intensity of God's pursuit of you. You are in a low point so that you will look up and see the God of heaven who loved you before you ever thought of loving him the God of heaven who formed you, who created you, and who wants you to be his forever, the God of heaven, the King of heaven, who's the only one who can truly deliver on peace and joy in your life. You you may look at the low point in your life and feel like this is so low. The depth of the low point, Eric, is lower than you can even imagine. The depth of your low point it just gives you a picture of the depth of God's love for you, that he is willing to do anything and everything to get you to look up so that he can be the one who quenches you, who becomes your savior, who becomes your king. Because anything else that you make the king in your life, anything else that I make king in my life is unable to deliver us, unable to satisfy us, unable to rescue us from our sin and our shame. Only King Jesus is able to handle the burden of being our king. Everything else is unable to handle being the king of our lives. 
the only one who's able to handle the weight of being our king is the one who created us, the one who loves us, the one who pursues us, the one who died on a cross to remove our sin and our shame if we will look up and believe in him. Only Jesus can handle the weight and the burden of being your king. And he longs to be your king. And the low points that he brings us to in our lives or the low points that he allows us to experience in our lives are precious and gracious if in your low point you will look up and be reminded that there is a true king, a better king, and his name is Jesus. Listen, my prayer for you, if you are going through a low point in your life, is by God's grace, the low point will be the turning point where you look and you see his grace. Babylon, the kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar was the king of, this kingdom did not last. No earthly kingdom did or will, but the everlasting kingdom that Jesus, the true king, started, his kingdom remains forever. And his kingdom is the kingdom that you're invited to. His kingdom is the kingdom that brings you joy and life. Jesus, as he walked this earth, he talked about his kingdom. Now, his kingdom, Jesus invited unlikely people to be in his kingdom. He, he said this one time, Jesus did. He said, the religious leaders, you people who think you have it all together, you are far from the kingdom. But the people who are at the low point in their life, the people who've made an absolute mess in your life, you are close to the kingdom because you realize you need the king. You realize you need me. And you, if you think you have it all together, you're far from the kingdom. But if you realize that you need King Jesus, you are you're exactly in the right place, Jesus says. So here's what Jesus said about his kingdom. Now, I want you to notice this passage. Because his Jewish audience would have, would have recognized the language from what we just read in Daniel chapter four. Remember, Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, you're like that large tree. Your kingdom is because birds of the air come and nest in the branches. Your kingdom is so powerful that, that other nations and other people come and benefit from your kingdom's existence, Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that language we read in Daniel 4? Notice what Jesus says. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when grown, it's taller than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. Jesus, as he pulled people to himself, said, this kingdom I'm starting, it is starting very small and it's going to grow very large. And it has, what Jesus said would happen has happened as people like me and people like you and people from other nations. And, and one day every tribe, tongue and nation are gathered together. We join in his kingdom. His kingdom has indeed become a large tree. But notice what he says. So the birds of the branches nest in its so the birds of the air nest in its branches. In other words, the kingdom we're a part of grows large, but also blesses the nations, blesses other people, which is why we're a part of a kingdom that seeks the good of our cities, that cares for people outside of the kingdom of God, because we wanna, in, we wanna believe and hold on to the vision that Jesus had for his kingdom that the birds of the air nest in the branches of the kingdom that we are a part of. And Jesus began a kingdom that never ends. Jesus came here to pursue you so that at your low point, you could look up to him. Jesus entered this world and started his kingdom in humility. He entered this world through the womb of a teenage virgin, virgin named Mary, was born, on the backside of nowhere, but his kingdom grew. And you've been invited to be a part of his kingdom. He entered in humility. He made you his own, his son, his daughter, if you have believed in him in humility, because this king, King Jesus, is unlike any other king. He placed himself on a cross, a Roman cross, so that if you believe in Jesus, all your sin and your shame 
is placed on Jesus and it's no longer on you. He is the king and such a good king is this king. To remind us of what King Jesus has done for us, to bring us into his kingdom, we are going to take communion together today. Sin entered the world because there was a tree in the Garden of Eden that humanity, we would have done the same, ate from, essentially saying, we wanna be in charge. That's how sin entered the world. Salvation is offered to all people because Jesus placed himself on another tree. He was on the center tree, the center cross between two common thieves. John Stott, a famous theologian, he said, the essence of sin is us placing ourselves where only God deserves to be. We place ourselves on the throne of our lives. That's what sin is. We wanna be the king apart from him. That's the essence of sin. The essence of salvation is God placing himself where only we deserve to be. And that is God placing himself on the middle tree on the cross. The tree in the garden, we place ourselves where only God deserves to be, the one in charge. We try to make ourselves in charge and it hasn't worked out for us. We have not been quenched. We've not been satisfied. That's the essence of sin, that tree. The essence of salvation is what Jesus came here to do for you. And you trusted him if you are his and you now have life. Let's remember what Christ did for us. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus said, this meal is gonna represent my body given for you and my blood poured out for you. He took the bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body. Take and eat. He then took the cup and he said, this cup is the covenant, the new covenant. My blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Jesus, we are so thankful that you entered this world for us, you are the true king. You are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You entered this world and so that we could look up to you and receive your mercy and your grace, you died on the cross for us. We remember with gratitude today, your body, which absorbed all of our sin and our shame, your blood, which was spilled so that we could be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. You are the great King. It's in your name we pray, amen. Hey, I'm so glad that you joined us for our service today. And I hope and pray that God used this message to encourage you right where you are. I'd love if you hit the subscribe button because then you could get the next alert for whenever we have services and whenever we ever offer content here on YouTube. So subscribe and join us for Mariners Online.